Now joined by Hofstra Law Professor James Sample to help us navigate the legal process. James Sample, good afternoon to you. Thanks so much for taking some time to talk to us. Good to be with you. You're familiar with the arraignment process from inside the courtroom. Can you give us an overview of what will happen to the former president when he surrenders at court today and in just a short time? Sure. I mean, he's going to be fingerprinted. You've heard uh, in your earlier reporting that he will not have a mugshot taken. He's one of the most recognizable figures in the world, and he's going to be released on his own recognizance. But the actual arraignment process typically would take only five to ten minutes. He'll have the charges presented to him by the prosecutor in hard copy, and they'll also be presented to, in hard copy to the judge. He'll have the opportunity to have them read to him. I suspect he will waive the reading of the charges and will merely then enter his plea, which will clearly be not guilty. And at that point, we will find out whether or not the judge decides to impose any constraints on what Mr. Trump might say about the case. Uh, there's been a lot of activity, as you both know on social media and other, and, and other places with respect to threats against the district attorney, mischaracterizations and harsh characterizations of the judge. And I think that Mr. Trump will be made aware that at least in the confines of litigation, he's not in charge. And let me ask you this, yeah, I know you're referencing a gag order potentially. We've talked to some experts today. I don't necessarily think that's a good idea, but then of course knowing the background and the history of this president, how he likes to get on social media and basically tell you everything. What are your thoughts on what this judge will do as it relates to a gag order? Chris, it's a, it's a good question, and I think it will ultimately boil down to Judge Marchand's discretion. But I suspect that his initial inclination would be to be relatively cautious. I mean, Mr. Trump is running for president again in 2024. There are First Amendment considerations to take into account. On the other hand, if Trump decides to cross the line after today, after he is officially a criminal defendant, then I suspect that there'll be a relatively short leash and that Judge Mershon will uh, very quickly, if Mr. Trump does cross that kind of a line, remind him that there is a line and that the, the fundamental fair process to which he's entitled. And let's be clear, Donald Trump is absolutely entitled to all of the protections of due process and all of the protections that we afford a criminal defendant but that's because that's what he is. And if he decides to try and have it both ways and threaten the judge, threaten the prosecutors, ultimately down the road, potentially threaten potential jurors, he's going to find out that that is the way in which you can get in trouble real quickly. If we could talk about the indictment, it will be unsealed in just a couple of hours. What do you expect to see in that? How serious are these charges? We're hearing more than one felony count here. What is your take on this and what's expected. Mary, I think Marsha's reporting is, is right on the mark, and her assessment earlier is consistent with mine. We've been told that there are approximately 34 separate counts and that those counts will be Class E felonies. Now, the underlying predicate charge here, and this is going to be one of the focal points of the case, one of the, the fulcrums of this case, is that the underlying predicate offense here, the falsification of business records, is a misdemeanor in the normal course. However, if that misdemeanor is carried out in the, in furtherance of covering up another crime, and it appears that that other crime here would be a federal campaign finance offense, then it can be elevated to a mis to to a felony. You've seen Mr. Trump's attorney Joe Tacopina already press on this point, saying that we're mixing federal charges with state charges, that this is a novel theory, and let's be that that's absolutely a good argument for a defendant to make. It's not a good position to be in, but it is one of the arguments that he'll try and advance. When this indictment is unsealed in roughly two hours or so, how confident are you on the strength of, of Alvin Bragg's case here? I mean, I, I'm sure he would not bring this to a grand jury unless it was substantive. Um, but then again, as you mentioned, Joe Tacopina says there is there's no validity to, the, to this case whatsoever. Chris, I think that Alvin Bragg is has been cautious to the point of being so careful that two of his attorneys chose to resign because he wasn't ready to bring a case earlier and, and when they wanted him to bring the case. So he's clearly been very cautious all along. On the other hand, the stakes here are obviously historic, incredibly high. In a 247-year history of the country, we've never seen a former president be criminally indicted. It would be foolish to bring 
bring a case that was not rock solid, at least on the underlying predicate offenses. Now, it's very possible that he might only be able to prove the misdemeanor portions of these charges, the underlying predicate offense, and that he might have a tougher mountain to climb in terms of uh, reaching the felony and showing that these uh, payments, that the, the falsification of business records with these payments was intended to cover up another offense. That's a harder hill to climb, but I suspect that Alvin Bragg feels very, very confident in the underlying predicate offense. Now, let's ask you about the uh, Trump legal strategy. I mean, what are you expecting to see here and what should it be? Mary, I think that Trump, the legal strategy is there's almost no one in America who's been involved in more litigation. Now, most of that litigation has been civil litigation. And historically, his approach has been to attack, attack, attack outside the courtroom. We've already seen that taking place. He'll engage in spin control. He'll engage in attacks on the prosecutor, attacks on the process. He'll re reference this as a witch hunt and being weaponized against him for partisan political ends. And then inside the courtroom, the strategy will be delay, delay, delay. And he has every right to engage in those delays, which is to say they will engage in a number of pretrial motions, motions to dismiss the charges, motions to exclude evidence in the case. And then ultimately, when the case does go to trial, his strategy will be to attack the credibility of the witnesses at every turn. If Michael Cohen, as he appears to be, is going to be a central witness in the case, he's obviously an individual who's got some credibility issues. Issues. Then again, to get at the truth in Trump world, you need to talk to a whole bunch of people who lie for a living. That's what this case is going to be about. James, we've got to let you go here, but real quickly, the addition of Todd Blanche to Trump's legal team, a good move or a bad move? It, it's a great move. It's a, I mean, it's clearly a move. He's a savvy individual. He's familiar with the Manhattan DA's office, and he adds some substantive muscle to the team that is primarily with Joe Tacopina more about press outside the courtroom than it is about litigation inside it. A good move for sure, Chris. Professor James Sample, thanks so much. We'll be talking to you in the next couple of days. We appreciate it. Thank you.